These are United States Marines, the same Marines that have served our country since 1775. This is the story of a year in their lives. Let's start it with Lieutenant General Lewis W. Walsh, Commanding General of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force in 1966. Our Marines of World War II and Korea experienced many trying days. The heat and the mosquitoes of the tropics, the snow and the sub-zero weather and temperatures of Korea. Today, we find ourselves back in the tropics, among the mosquitoes. And we have today that same dedicated Marine who learned long ago to endure these personal hardships to accomplish his mission. This is a story of Marines and of strangers in far places a world apart giving voice to an anguished cry answered by these Marines. It is a story of distinguished achievement. Call it Marine 66. Yes, call it Marine 66. And start it in the Caribbean with Marine Helicopter Squadron 365 moving in from the aircraft carrier Boxer to the areas of the Dominican Republic and Haiti, battered by the savage onslaught of Hurricane Inez. The story of the heroic effort from two of the squadron officers Major Kermit Andrews, commanding officer of HMM 365. Our first view of the damage caused by Hurricane Inus was the southern tip of Domrep. I've seen damage done by hurricanes before, but never in my life had I seen the complete destruction of, of woods, buildings, everything that was standing. In fact, the southern tip of Domrep, uh, one huge area, even the leaves were gone from the trees. We spent the majority of the first three days working out of Barahona, delivering food. We did fly into some remote villages uh, in between the clouds, high in the mountains, and deliver food and evacuate uh, injured people. But for the most part, the government had taken care of their own injured. On the fourth, when our operations, major part of our operations shifted into Haiti, I don't think any of us were prepared for the terrible conditions that we found in the remote mountain villages there. The people were, that had been injured during the storm from flying tin were still in, uh, had absolutely no medical aid. In fact, I saw people with huge cuts, broken uh, limbs, uh, with absolutely no first aid. Dirty rags, if any, were used as bandages. The majority of the cases that we evacuated from the uh, remote towns in Haiti were stretcher cases. Uh, pregnant women who were in terrible shape. In fact, uh, I evacuated one woman who became a mother uh, immediately after touchdown in the, the city of Jacques Mel. Captain John Franco, pilot training officer for HMM 365. On the 4th, 5th, and 6th, when we went to Haiti, I myself worked the area east of Jacques Mal to Marigot and the little town of Pareto. Destruction there was almost total. Ignorance of even the simplest first aid processes hampered our efforts. The squadron flew about 450 hours in these six days in the Dominican Republic and Haiti and everyone was exhausted at the completion of it. But I believe one remark made, the, made it worth all the effort. The lady from the Dominican Republic told us, we used to say and mean, Yankee, go home. Now we can say and mean, welcome, Yankee. Welcome, Yankee. The Marines in Vietnam hear much the same words day after day in village after village, where the diplomats and dungarees let civic action demonstrate conclusively that Americans care. These acts of friendship and understanding have their beginnings a very long way off in the villages and cities of the United States, where other Marines, members of the organized reserve, which last year celebrated its 50th anniversary, helped gather the funds through which the CARE organization is able to provide these vitally needed goods and services.
66 was a year of new beginnings. This March in the Sun had its beginning 10,000 miles away at Camp Pendleton, California, where the 5th Marine Division came back into being for the first time since World War II. After a few weeks of intensive training, the first increment of the division, the 26th Marines, received the word. It would soon be on its way to Vietnam to support our total military effort. For the men of the regiment, it was a real shot in the arm. Embarkation was an old, familiar process for some of the men. For others, it was another first. They and their sea bags loading on for the long voyage that would cross the international date line aboard the helicopter carrier that would take them into their first action. on the Iwo Jima put the 26th Marines ashore as a special landing force, a new concept in Marine operations that was to prove dramatically effective. The 5th Marine Division was back in action. Major contact came in a pre-dawn attack by a battalion of regular North Vietnamese troops against a well-prepared Marine position. Dawn showed the enemy had made a costly error. At least 65 of their well-armed and equipped troops were found dead as the patrols moved out. Many others lay wounded on the field of battle, abandoned by their fleeing comrades. Our Navy corpsmen gave them aid. The men of the 5th Marine Division had acquitted themselves with valor and distinction. Since World War II, Marine 66 included combat artists. One of the first to pack his paintbrushes and pistol, Marine Reserve Captain John Dyer of Boston. I think this country over here is a beautiful country. It's, uh, it's an inspiration to anyone with any sort of an artistic guy. My one feeling is, is that I'd like to come back to this country someday when I don't have to wear a 45 on my hip. Kids out there are all gathered around here, and they're all trying to see what I'm doing, and uh, they're really not upsetting my work at all. As a matter of fact, I get quite a kick out of the way that they seem so interested in it. Usually, the uh, kids try to uh, uh, pose when you try to take a picture of them, you know? Have you ever seen the way that uh, the women will shy away from a picture, and the men and the younger children seem to uh, just put themselves out and uh, pose? You can never... It's a hard thing to get them in a natural uh, position because the minute they see the camera, they uh, sort of freeze up. At every turn in Vietnam, something demands the attention of the combat artists. But even more dramatic and more demanding, the terrible personal plight of the people of this war-torn country. The Hua Khan Children's Hospital is just one example of the vast civic action effort through which thousands of Americans, military and civilian, are striving to help the people of another nation achieve security and independence. The story of Hua Khan is best told by the doctor who directs it, Lieutenant Commander John A. Kornabach. Last November, 1965, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines came into this area 
your walk on. They immediately started on a MedCap program, a medical civil affairs program, with a doctor, foreman, would go out daily to the various refugee villages, schools, and orphanages to have and hold sick call for the children and also the older people out there. This was very successful and even got up to the point where they were treating 12 to 14,000 a month. However, there was one problem in that when medications were given to these children, we never knew whether they were given the medications by their parents or whether they were given proper treatment as we had prescribed and explained to their parents. Therefore, the two doctors who were here at the time, Dr. Wilkerson and Dr. Shahadi, decided to try and build their own small pediatric clinic in order to better care for these children. Last December, with the help of 7th engineers, one small section with a tent was built which contained 11 beds. The children were soon admitted to the hospital. The first one was admitted on December 26th. With proper care, medications, and good food, the children who were coming in very ill, almost near death, were being returned home in a very healthy and happy state. The parents soon realized what we were here for, and they began bringing more and more children to our gate and to our hospital. So, in 66, we are winning the civic action. And in every sector, our forces piled up a commanding record in the military action. The year and the combat climaxed with the two major operations fought in this rugged terrain just south of the demilitarized zone that separates North and South Vietnam. Operations Hastings and Prairie. Their smashing success demolished the enemy plan to move troops into South Vietnam through the DMZ. Hastings was initiated by Major General Lowell M. English. Prairie was carried on by Major General Wood B. Kyle. General English describes the early action. Back in May, it became evident that the North Vietnamese were building up in this area to the south of the DMZ. We believe that there are as many as three regiments in this area, and as a result, we have engaged in an operation along with the 1st Arvin Division in this area, with the Arvin Airborne in this area, and with the Marine Task Force Delta in this area. On the 15th of this month, we started Operations Hastings by inserting two battalions in this general area. We had reason to believe that there was a division command post in this area, and our purpose was to find it and to destroy it. Just how well the Marines reacted as Operation Hastings developed is described by the briefing officer, Major Donald Book. During the period 1-15 July, 18 reconnaissance teams were inserted into the area. 17 of these teams made contact with North Vietnamese forces. This reconnaissance effort established that a large number of well-disciplined, well-equipped, well-trained North Vietnamese units were in the area and had developed a major trail network as an infiltration route. General Kyle directed CT Task Force Delta to attack initially with two infantry battalions, retaining one battalion in reserve at Dong Ha. Thereafter, as the reserve battalion was committed, an additional battalion would be moved north from Da Nang to reconstitute the reserve. Following this pattern of operations, Task Force Delta grew from the initial three infantry battalions to a total of seven, including the Special Landing Force of the 7th Fleet. The movement of units north was accomplished primarily by Marine Corps KC-130 aircraft. Most of the supplies were also moved from Da Nang to Dong Ha by these same aircraft. The movement of units from Dong Ha into the field and the logistic support of units in the field was primarily by the two helicopter groups of the 1st Marine Air Wing. Task Force Delta's concept was to place blocking forces across the major infiltration trails 
to prevent movement into and out of the combat area, and then commence searching for the enemy forces. At 0830 on D-Day, 15 July, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marine, landed in the Song Yong Valley by helicopter. And followed at 10 minutes by 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, landing at the mouth of the valley. No fire was encountered during the initial landing. However, by mid-afternoon, fire was being received from three sides by the 3rd Battalion. Kilo Company had moved into a blocking position to the south, and by nightfall was under heavy attack from all sides. Heavy fighting was to be encountered by all units at one time or another throughout the area for the next nine days. It became evident that a major part of the 324B Division was in Zone B. Hastings and Prairie, Marine combat photographers and Marine combat reporters were in the thick of the fight. All of their reporting was spectacular, both in the air and on the ground. One of the most dramatic incidents in Operation Hastings occurred on July 25th, when Lima Company, 3rd Marines, fought its way to the support of India Company, trapped on a mountaintop by superior enemy forces. The action was photographed by Gunnery Sergeant J.J. Kozakowski and Lance Corporal N.D. Paul. Gunnery Sergeant Carl Hilton was there with his tape recorder, but his own voice was often drowned out by the fury of the fight. Months ago, it was cleared enough to allow two helicopters, one at a time, of course, to come in, and uh, they flew up with some wounded rings. Radio eight helicopters coming in again. This time they're on our right side. We're on a hilltop here, surrounded by drop offs all around. At 1200 on 3 August, Operation Hastings was terminated and Operation Prairie commenced. There was a different name for the new phase of the battle to control the real estate south of the demilitarized zone, but for the Marines, the same all-out action continued. They took casualties, but they demonstrated positively that they were more than a match for the enemy. 
By 13 August, it had become evident that the enemy was again moving forces into the area. The 4th Marines established a forward CP at Dong Ha, and additional forces were committed to the area. Operation Prairie was launched as a reconnaissance and force operation. While in Hastings, it was not unusual for elements of four or five battalions to be heavily engaged at one time. On only a few occasions have more than one battalion been engaged in heavy contact at the same time during Prairie. However, some of the most violent fighting of the war has taken place during this operation. Most of the heavy contact has occurred in the rock pile and Contin areas. On numerous occasions, both gun and flame tanks have been utilized, as well as 106mm recoilless rifles, naval gunfire, and flamethrowers, in addition to the other normal supporting arms. No matter what the supporting arms, the basic element in our success was the individual fighting man, with his calm confidence, his understanding of our mission in Vietnam, and his ability to adapt to the fast-moving circumstances of combat. Staff Sergeant Ken Sanders caught this on his tape recorder as acting platoon leader Staff Sergeant Jimmy Little briefed him on a company-sized patrol mission led by Captain Robert Larson. Here's Sergeant Little. To start with, we moved down in column, platoon in column, down across the river to Highway 9. Once we reach Highway 9, we will uh, make a left, go down 9 about 700 meters to a trail that cuts up in a canopy where the third platoon had made contact yesterday. From there, we will use this trail, uh, working out the trail on around, hoping to come back up on the top of the ridge line at uh, about 1,500 meters from here. Uh, from here, we'll conduct a sweep through the area where the heaviest contact was made yesterday uh, to clear out any possible VC that are in there and uh, the search for bodies and weapons. From there, we'll work on down the ridge line, reach Highway 9 to our right, and then come back into the base camp. We have begun uh, movement down the trail. We encountered the Viet Cong a few minutes ago. There is a good possibility that the North Vietnamese Communists have set an ambush for us. We'll find out if there's an ambush in that area, perhaps very soon. led to final conclusive success. General Kyle summarized its importance. Timely, effective action by U.S. and Republic of Vietnam units delivered a crushing defeat to the enemy and shattered his hopes for a quick and impressive victory. Hastings and its successor, Prairie, stand as notable achievements in our battle against communist aggression from North Vietnam. Notable achievements and uncommon valor. Uncommon valor in support of a just and worthy cause, which the President of the United States defined when he presented the Medal of Honor to Sergeant Robert E. O'Malley. I can think of only one gift sufficient to honor men like this. We can assure this man, and we can assure every man who wears our uniform, that their cause is a good cause that the principles they stand for are sound principles, that the battle they are fighting deserves their bravery, to back a commitment honorably given, that is a good cause, to shield a nation from aggression, that is a good cause, to defend men 
against coercion and intimidation. That is a good cause. To prove that terror and aggression simply will not work, that is a good cause. Marines 66, the same gallant, dedicated men serving their country as they have since 1775 and will until the end of time. Since medieval times, the prisoner of war has been a byproduct of human conflict. Usually he is faceless to all but his relatives and friends, although his general circumstances and treatment may achieve renown. The Vietnam War produced its share of prisoners. More than 650 Americans were captured between 1964 and 1973. But these prisoners did not remain faceless. As year after year passed, virtually every American came to know the name of at least one prisoner one lonely wife, or one fatherless child, because some of these prisoners were in captivity for nearly nine years, longer than any POWs in any other war. During that time, they grew from a few forgotten Americans in an obscure Asian prison to the central figures in the final disengagement of United States forces. This is the story of their captivity. <laughs> This is a reconstruction of a prison cell in the Hanoi Hilton. Very likely one of the first cells which a newly captured prisoner of war would see. It's a solitary or a solo cell used for isolating POWs. Isolation was a common pressure exerted on US POWs in North Vietnam, with almost all of them spending some months in solitary and a few as much as four years. One newly captured pilot spent his first 1,000 days in isolation, much of it in a cell like this. In the next few minutes, we're going to look in more detail at the conditions of captivity. That is, the physical aspects of the POW environment, the cells, the food, the prison camps themselves, and the treatment afforded by the captor, the interrogations, the physical, and the psychological pressures. More than 650 Americans were captured in Southeast Asia between 1964 and 1973, with by far the greatest number being captured in North Vietnam. Nearly all of these men were Air Force and Navy pilots, most of them captured during the bombing over North Vietnam from 1966 to 1968. Those captured in South Vietnam were generally Army and Marine Corps personnel, but as we will see, very few of them were confined in South Vietnam. Instead, they were moved north into prison camps in the Hanoi area. In Laos, U.S. rescue forces recovered many more downed airmen, and there were correspondingly fewer prisoners. Only nine men were returned by the path at Lao. These men had spent only a few weeks in Laos before they, too, were moved into North Vietnam for detention. None of these captives from Laos or South Vietnam were ever acknowledged as POWs by North Vietnam until the 1973 ceasefire. Of 122 U.S. prisoners returned by the Viet Cong, 
only 28 were actually released in South Vietnam. These men were all captured in this general area and never moved far from a series of camps in the border regions of South Vietnam and Cambodia. The other POWs released by the Viet Cong had all been captured north of De Lot City and then moved into North Vietnam for detention. These men were sometimes moved in large groups, as were the 41 POWs taken during the Tet Offensive of early 1968, while others were moved either individually or in small groups of two to three men. Virtually all followed a northward course, something like this, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail Network. The environment for those POWs held in South Vietnam was primitive. Camps generally consisted of bamboo cages, small huts, or bunkers. Life was hard. The prisoners were often bound or chained for long periods, not as deliberate maltreatment, but as a security measure. Their treatment was usually based on individual camp policy. What happened in one camp had no noticeable effect on treatment in other camps. Movement of the prisoners was frequent and often involved walking for weeks between campsites. Major R.C. Shrump of the Army was held in 12 different camps during five years of captivity. The prisoners' daily routine, which usually consisted of simply surviving from day to day without amenities of any sort, varied little. Exposure to the elements posed a chronic health threat, and medical treatment by trained doctors was virtually non-existent, although some of the Viet Cong served as medical aides. The prisoners suffered constantly from malnutrition complicated by frequent attacks of dysentery, dermatitis, and malaria. Over the years, one out of five men captured died in captivity. Generally, it was more difficult to survive captivity in South Vietnam, but on the other hand, it was not so difficult to escape from camps in the South as from those in the North. There were 26 successful escapes in South Vietnam, representing more than 12% of the PWs captured. This is Hanoi, ultimate destination for nearly all of the Americans captured in Southeast Asia. Lying some 60 miles inland at the core of the Red River Delta, the city contains more than one million Vietnamese and is still studded with 8th century pagodas as well as more recent remnants of the French administration. One of these 20th century architectural remains is Hua Lo Prison, built by the French in the early 1900s. It occupies an entire city block in downtown Hanoi, just across the street from the Ministry of Justice. Hua Lo Prison quickly became known as the Hanoi Hilton in the early days of the war when U.S. prisoners were held in this corner of the camp while the rest of it was used for Vietnamese criminals. American POWs eventually devised nicknames for three major sections of the prison installation. In 1967, the original Hanoi Hilton became known as Little Vegas when the POWs sardonically named their cells and cell blocks after Las Vegas casinos, Thunderbird, The Mint, Riviera, Stardust, and others. The adjacent corner of the camp was first known simply as Heartbreak because most interrogations were conducted here. In 1971, it acquired another nickname, New Guy Village, because newly captured POWs, or New Guys, received initial processing in this area. The third and largest section of the prison, opened in late 1970 after the raid on the Sante POW camp, became known as Camp Unity, because here all U.S. POWs were housed together for the first time. It was composed of nine large open bay cell blocks surrounding an interior courtyard and exercise area and could hold as many as 400 prisoners. A total of 13 camps were used to confine U.S. POWs in North Vietnam. Eight of these were located outside the city of Hanoi, generally to the west. The Briar Patch, for example, was opened in 1966 in conjunction with the war crimes program being conducted at that time. The North Vietnamese moved some 50 prisoners into this camp and subjected them to continuing pressure in an effort to force them to confess to war crimes against the people of North Vietnam. Dan Hoy Barracks, or Camp Faith as the prisoners called it, 
was the largest camp opened outside of Hanoi, housing more than 200 POWs in the last months of 1970. During this time, the prisoners experienced communal living for the first time, following nearly six years of continuing effort to isolate them as much as possible. Another camp, nicknamed Dog Patch, was unusual in two ways. First, it was located far from Hanoi and within 10 miles of the Chinese border in a relatively inaccessible area of North Vietnam. Secondly, unlike any other camp used in North Vietnam, it was heavily camouflaged even at ground level so that local villagers would not know of the presence of American POWs. This was probably to ensure that these prisoners would not be lost to a U.S. rescue effort in the last months of the war. Finally, this is a Sante camp as it looked in 1969. The small isolated compound located nearly 25 miles west of Hanoi and outside of the North Vietnamese heavy anti-aircraft defenses was a nearly perfect target for a rescue attempt. On November 20, 1970, a small helicopter-borne assault force landed in the camp, hoping to rescue some 50 POWs thought to be held there. Unfortunately, although the raid was executed without complication, the prisoners had routinely been moved to another camp about 15 miles away. Continued activity by Vietnamese remaining in the area produced all the outward signs of an active prison camp so that the raid was launched against an empty compound. Immediately after the raid, the North Vietnamese hurriedly evacuated all camps outside of Hanoi and moved all prisoners into the Camp Unity portion of the Hanoi Hilton. As we will see later, this centralization of POWs forced the captor to abandon his efforts at isolating and separating the prisoners and for the first time allowed the POWs to organize effectively. In general, treatment of U.S. prisoners in North Vietnam can be characterized as falling into one of three major periods. From the capture of the first POWs in mid-1964 until late in 1965, there was little physical mistreatment or torture. To be sure, the POWs were interrogated for military information, but these interrogations, while using physical inducements, such as denial of food and sleep, would not be characterized as brutal, inhumane, or even unusual. But in the fall of 1965, the Vietnamese attitude toward interrogation changed. Not only had their former interrogation techniques failed to produce much usable information, but the North Vietnamese administration had also launched a new effort to exploit POWs for propaganda purposes. Without dire coercion, prisoners were not likely to sign the confessions and the apologies demanded by the captor. And as a consequence, the Vietnamese started a torture program, which was to last for nearly four years. Torture has been defined as the application of pain so intense as to cause loss of consciousness or will. Much of the physical abuse begun by the North Vietnamese in late 1965 fits this definition. Often the prisoners would be forced to, in effect, torture themselves by being made to stand, sit, or kneel for unbearably extended periods. One prisoner was forced to lean against a wall from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. for six and one half days. Another sat on a stool without food or water for over three days. When a man passed out or feigned passing out, he was beaten back into position. The worst physical abuse, however, was that applied directly by the captor, whose favorite accessories were ropes, iron bars, and foot stocks, which he combined in a variety of ways. Prisoners were frequently fastened by their ankles and stocks. Then their hands were handcuffed behind their backs and their arms bound together with rope from wrist to elbow. Then a longer rope could be run from the prisoner's arms around his body and through the iron bar at his feet to force him into a variety of trust positions depending on the strength and imagination of the guards. In one variation, the rope was tied to the prisoner's elbows and then tossed over a rafter so that the prisoner's entire body could be hoisted off the floor. In some cells, footstocks were used to secure the prisoner to his bed. It was a simple matter for the guards to turn these stocks into an even more rigorous instrument of torture. Floggings were another common form of torture prior to 1969. 
prisoners were bound to tables or even trees and then beaten with bamboo sticks or thin strips of rubber cut from old truck tires until they lost consciousness. In some floggings, the prisoner was lashed 800 to 1,000 times. Physical punishments like these were generally combined with isolation, denial of food and sleep, withholding of medical care, and general harassment. Even when mistreatment was commonplace for nearly all prisoners, the captor generally tried to cite a moral justification for the torture. Most commonly, he would create a convenient accusation that one of the camp regulations had been broken. The offending prisoner would be punished for his alleged violation and then allowed to atone for his sins by offering some information or propaganda the captor desired. This was one of the many uses of, of the camp rules imposed during the earliest days of confinement to form a daily program of humiliation and harassment of the POWs. All U.S. aggressors caught red-handed in the piratical attack against the Democratic Republic of Vietnam are criminals. While detained in this camp, you will strictly obey the following rules. All criminals will bow to all Vietnamese in the camp. All criminals must show polite attitude at all times, or they will be severely punished. All criminals will truthfully answer orally or in writing any question, or do anything directed by the camp authority. Criminals are forbidden to attempt to communicate with each other in Following these four years of very harsh conditions, the third and final period of treatment began in October 1969. This period, the final three years of captivity, saw an end to heavy torture and the beginning of lighter punishment, better food, and generally improved living conditions. There's been much speculation as to the cause of this change, but it was probably due in large measure to pressure by both American and international public opinion which reached a crescendo during 1969 and 1970. Additionally, the Vietnamese were finding that POW resistance was frustrating many of their propaganda efforts, and that the world at large was labeling their few successes as pure propaganda. Also, a number of prisoners were sick and dying from the poor treatment, and the captor realized he could not allow prison conditions to deteriorate further. Throughout captivity, prisoners were subjected to interrogations, many conducted under the conditions shown here. In the early years of the war, the interrogators were mainly interested in military information, such as types of aircraft flown, combat tactics used, and types of weapons employed. In these years, however, interrogations were largely unsuccessful, owing to general ineptness at interrogation, the language barrier, and lack of familiarity with the U.S. military. As an example of this lack of understanding, Navy pilots were often interrogated, or quizzed as the prisoners referred to it, on the supply system required to support the Navy task force in Southeast Asia. These interrogations, however, were often aimed at collecting detailed sketches of aircraft carriers, complete with diagrams of the holding pins for pigs and chickens. Later, the Vietnamese became more sophisticated and knowledgeable and could put much greater pressure on the prisoners. Sign it. Then we will see that your arm is treated immediately. You know I can't do that. You are trying our patience, criminal. I've given you all the information. The greatest pressures, however, were usually reserved for efforts aimed at the extraction of propaganda statements. Although the prisoners were usually successful in evading answers to military questions, there was little opportunity to evade when confronted with a propaganda statement. The prisoner had only two choices, to sign or not to sign. The most extensive campaign of political extortion was initiated in mid-1966 when the Vietnamese began trying to extract written confessions what they termed war crimes. Prisoners were pressured to confess and apologize for violations of North Vietnamese airspace and for alleged bombings of churches, schools, hospitals, and other civilian facilities. 
The POWs were likewise pressured to praise the good treatment being accorded them and to submit written requests for the forgiveness of the Vietnamese people. The so-called war crimes program was launched with the infamous Hanoi March of July 1966, during which 52 POWs were marched through the streets of Hanoi and beaten, kicked, and stoned by an agitated crowd. Radio broadcasts described the hatred of the Vietnamese people and their demands that the prisoners be tried as war criminals. The only alternative to trial and execution, so the Vietnamese told the POWs, was to confess one's crimes and to assume a proper, that is, a cooperative attitude. In the face of these threats, not a single POW chose to comply. There followed a prolonged period of torture, during which the prisoners were humiliated as never before, and eventually coerced into writing the statements which the captor desired. Visiting delegations, both U.S. and foreign, were attracted by such statements, and all wanted to interview an American POW. These visitors were always taken to one of the showplace camps in Hanoi, where they would be allowed to view selected prisoners. The most frequently visited camp in the early years of the war is shown here and was known to the POWs as the plantation. Men were pressured and sometimes tortured to meet with visiting delegations and to recite memorized accounts of their humane treatment in anti-war sentiments. Prisoners were allowed special recreational privileges for the duration of these visits, as in this basketball game at another showplace camp, the zoo. This particular camp was once a French officer's recreation center and later a major Vietnamese motion picture studio before becoming a prison facility in 1965. Rooms such as these were presented to visitors as typical of prisoner living conditions, when in fact, nearly all POWs were confined at other camps under much different circumstances. Even though the prisoners could be coerced into meeting with visiting groups, they were often able to display very clearly the forced nature of their participation by remaining completely emotionless, and even more explicitly, by casually displaying an outright gesture of contempt for the cameraman. The prisoners were constantly alert for ways to circumvent the Vietnamese efforts at isolation and exploitation, and consequently were usually able to maintain some degree of communication and organization. A major goal of all POW organizations is escape, and the prisoners in North Vietnam were no exception. Escape from North Vietnam, however, was extremely difficult, and there were in fact only several occasions on which U.S. POWs actually launched serious escape efforts. The camps themselves posed no great obstacle. Guard forces were small and not highly trained, and the only barrier to escape was often only a six-foot fence. Once over that fence, however, the tall Caucasian in striped pajamas was hardly inconspicuous on the streets of Hanoi. Once out of Hanoi, he was still faced with many difficult miles of heavily populated territory where his race, language, and size, as well as a hostile populace, would make movement nearly impossible. In October 1967, however, two prisoners did make a daring effort to escape. They found themselves loosely confined in a camp near the Hanoi Thermal Power Plant, with the Red River only a few hundred yards away. Seizing on the opportunity, with almost no advanced preparation, the men easily escaped the camp and then entered the river, hoping to float out to sea, where perhaps they could contact a U.S. Navy patrol. The men floated downstream throughout the night, covering nearly nine miles before morning. As dawn approached, the two were spotted by fishermen, who quickly recaptured them and returned them to Hanoi. On their return to Hanoi, the two escapees joined nine other prisoners, senior men who had been designated as organizers and troublemakers, in a new camp nicknamed Alcatraz. This camp consisted of 11 isolation cells located in two small buildings within the North Vietnamese Ministry of National Defense, again located in downtown Hanoi. Within this camp, almost total solitary confinement and 14 hours a day in leg irons would be the rule for nearly 25 months until the major improvement in treatment in late 1969. Another escape was attempted on a rainy night in 1969 when two other prisoners launched a well-planned effort from the zoo. 
The two escapees left their cell through a hole in the ceiling and then, dressed as Vietnamese peasants, attempted to skirt the western edge of Hanoi, again hoping to reach the Red River and drift out to sea. The men were recaptured the next morning, however, after about 10 hours of freedom. The escapees and some other POWs at the zoo were subjected to days of beatings and interrogations as the Vietnamese tried to purge the prisoner leadership and destroy the prisoner's communication network. This purge at the zoo was one of the last examples of really heavy torture in North Vietnam because in October 1969, after over four years of often brutal treatment, the watershed was reached. The air of generally harsh conditions was replaced with an atmosphere of lighter punishment and improved living conditions. The Vietnamese showed themselves to be very concerned with their world image as the commander of the Hanoi Hilton became the official scapegoat for the mounting publicity concerning the mistreatment of the prisoners. In a public apology to the people of North Vietnam, he was required to admit his misapplication of the government's lenient and humane policy toward captured personnel. The improved treatment was manifested in many ways. Additional clothing and blankets were issued, the cigarette ration was doubled from three to six per day, and the prisoners were allowed more time outside of their cells. The diet was also improved with the addition of noodles, more meat, and other items to the daily soup. Here is film footage released prior to 1969 by the Vietnamese in an attempt to depict the delicious and appetizing food routinely being served the prisoners. In reality, the POWs received such a meal only two or three times a year, on special occasions such as Tet, the Vietnamese New Year, and at Christmas. On all other days, they received only two meals, each consisting of a bowl of watery soup, generally pumpkin, and two small loaves of bread. Medical treatment also improved slightly in late 1969. But again, contrary to the propaganda films as shown here, care was seldom provided in professional hospital facilities. The most common medical problems included burns and fractures suffered during shoot down and capture, as well as dysentery, gastric problems, and intestinal parasites. In the absence of professional medical care, the POWs developed their own remedies for many ailments such as eating banana peels to control diarrhea and using toothpaste as an antiseptic cream. During 1970, the slow, progressive improvement in treatment continued. Some men, however, continued in isolation in each camp, and the majority of the POWs were not allowed to write or receive letters even after five to six years of captivity. Frequent altercations with the guards continued, usually over the POW's communication activities. At the same time, the POW organization improved in all camps in the reduced pressure atmosphere. In late 1970, as a result of the Sante Raid, the Vietnamese were forced to consolidate all POWs in their most secure prison, the Hanoi Hilton. The prisoners were quick to capitalize on this unprecedented opportunity to consolidate their strength and soon created the organization that would last through the final three years in captivity the 4th Allied POW Wing. The wing was composed of all 352 U.S. prisoners in the Hanoi Hilton, as well as three Thai POWs and a South Vietnamese Air Force Lieutenant, thus making it an Allied organization. The wing was designated as the 4th because this was the fourth time in this century, after World Wars I, II, and the Korean War, that U.S. servicemen had been in captivity. The goal of the POWs was formalized in the selection of the wing motto, Return with Honor. The wing was commanded by Major General John T. Flynn of the Air Force, at that time a colonel and a senior ranking man held prisoner. His staff included representatives of all services and extended down to each room in the Hilton, which was designated a squadron. The organization became quite complex and sophisticated, and as one returnee said, we had everything except a wildlife control officer and probably would have had that in a few more months. Prisoners, of course, 
did not have access to movies such as My Fair Lady. But some POWs had often seen a particular movie several times, and they became known as movie tellers, one of the prisoners' answers to entertainment. One prisoner, for example, began in the early days of captivity with a simple recounting of the basic plot of My Fair Lady, lasting perhaps an hour. By the end of captivity, he was producing a four and one half hour spectacular, complete with background music and lyrics. Another POW eventually developed an eight hour version of Gone with the Wind. Other prisoners became experts at recounting novels, while others developed complete courses of instruction in subjects such as French, Spanish, American history, art appreciation, philosophy, thermodynamics, and even auto mechanics. These courses were taught not only to cellmates, but to interested prisoners throughout the camp, with lectures being transmitted from room to room by tapping on the walls. The intellectual stimulation of these educational activities was a welcome relief to those men who had spent years in isolation, with nothing to do but exercise, daydream, and observe in minute detail the lives of spiders, lizards, and other tiny creatures sharing their cells. As the prisoners became more and more organized, and thus less susceptible to Vietnamese efforts to exploit or intimidate them, the relationship between the POWs and the captors slowly evolved into a live and let live philosophy. Each side established its own position and then refrained from provocative encroachments on the opposition's territory. The Vietnamese continued to probe the prisoners, however, always alert for an easy opportunity to propagandize or indoctrinate them. From the very first, the Vietnamese were eager to indoctrinate the prisoners in any way possible. In general, their efforts were not aimed at converting the POWs to communism, but rather more simply at lessening their faith in the U.S. government and its role in Southeast Asia. Prisoners were often lectured by camp officials who were always most ready to engage the POWs in philosophical discussions concerning the war. As in Korea, where the Chinese offered POWs the choice of either the reactionary or the progressive path, prisoners in Vietnam were confronted with the choice of the way of LBJ or the way of Ho Chi Minh. Failure to choose the right way meant poorer treatment, torture, and threats of life imprisonment or death. Regardless of the indoctrination technique employed, the POWs were well aware that they were getting only one side of the true story. To combat this distortion of the news, the prisoners sometimes employed a method of news interpretation, which they referred to as 180 degree decoding. That is, they simply believed exactly the opposite of what the Vietnamese said. So, for example, when this news item was reported over the camp radio by Hanoi Hanna, the prisoners calculated that the particular Sunday in question was Easter Sunday, the day of the massive Easter parade in New York, and that the true story was probably something more like this. As we noted earlier, the improvements in treatment beginning in late 1969 allowed the prisoners to recuperate greatly, both physically and mentally, from the preceding years of isolation, mistreatment, and physical abuse. If the prisoners had been released in mid-1969, we would have seen much poorer physical specimens returning from captivity. In the last months of imprisonment, beginning in September and October 1972, the Vietnamese even more markedly improved certain facets of POW life in the face of an imminent peace settlement. Extra food was distributed with special supplements for sick POWs. Men from all squadrons were allowed to mix outside more freely and to play volleyball, basketball, and other games. Some began to receive medical exams complete with chest x-rays. And finally, in the very last days of captivity, the Vietnamese began to recognize and deal with the leaders of the fourth wing, thus allowing the release itself to proceed smoothly under the direction of the wing staff. You've just seen some aspects of the captivity experience in Southeast Asia. What you have not seen, and what we cannot recreate for you, is an accurate portrayal of the intense emotional experiences which these men underwent in their many years of confinement. The life of a prisoner is not easy under any circumstances. When considering the major improvement in treatment in late 1969, one tends to conclude that captivity, although very tough before then, became almost bearable from that time on. But for the prisoner, the monotony, the anxieties, the fears, and the uncertainties of captivity continue through even the best periods of confinement. He lives in an environment almost totally devoid 
of one of man's most precious psychological commodities, a sense of security. That alone can have a tremendous debilitating effect through long years of confinement. One might ask, finally, how did captivity in Southeast Asia compare qualitatively with experiences in other wars? An answer to that question is found in the words of Air Force Colonel Richard Kern, a prisoner in Europe in 1944 and 1945, and again a prisoner for over eight years in North Vietnam. He said, Captivity with the Germans in World War II was rough, but I was treated like a human. My experience in Southeast Asia was completely unbelievable, indescribable, and not of this world. a sense of honor, with a pride and a faith in their country which amazed many Americans. But the lesson which they learned and displayed so openly was one instructed by Goethe years ago. What you have inherited from your fathers, earn over again for yourselves, or it will not be yours. These men had experienced a crisis of freedom as few other Americans have. They had been forced to examine themselves closely, to forego the pursuit of ease, and to rediscover the resources of vigor, faith, courage, and imagination, which are required for survival. Intense thought, burning idealism, unlimited sacrifice. These were the attributes that made it possible for these men to return with honor. Thank you.